Greetings and welcome to my new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel. And today I'm going to be redoing this old video, this old video here on calculus history, because at the time that I recorded that was around 2016, I think. And I was homeless without shelter. So there was a lot of passerby traffic and I didn't really have a very good computer. So let's begin. Now I'm going to shut this down, but I'll put a link to it in the detail section. And this is the original applet I designed, which covers it. So in my classes, I used to teach AP calculus, A level, and also um, the IB curriculum. And in my classes, I would design very fancy applets and cover all these details. So this is one of them, and I'll give you a link to all three of these applets. And sh I'll show you very quickly what they do. But first of all, I want to quickly go through the challenge. So the challenge, basically, was how to find the slope of a tangent line, this tangent line, at any point on the graph. Okay? The Newton's approach said, let's experiment. Okay? So that's all he did. He experimented. He just moved the green point. But of course, although the finite difference is defined everywhere along the curve for the secant line slopes, these green secant line slopes, it's not defined at the place that it matters most, at the point of tangency. So Newton imagined that there was some ultimate ratio at this point, okay, which he calls a limit, which is obviously a lot of garbage. Anyway, here's the finite difference, okay, so everywhere it's defined except here. All right. And of course, Newton had some kludgy algebra because uh, he would divide through by H and then simply set H to zero. And of course, uh, through the discovery of my historic geometric theorem in January 2020, it's actually legal to do that. Um, it's legal because the terms in H are the difference in slopes between the secant line and the tangent line slope. And you'll see that in my historic geometric theorem to which I'll also place a link. Of course, in the rigorous new calculus, the derivative is defined like this. And of course, also the integral is well defined. Okay. And it doesn't matter where you are. Okay. It doesn't matter where you are. Everything is 100% uh, rigorous. Okay. So, Unlike Newton's definition in the new calculus, the parallel secant line, this parallel secant line here, the green one, is always of the same slope as the tangent line, okay? Always. And of course, this expression here, which is given when you divide through by m plus n, is always that of the tangent line, okay? Before and after the difference quotient is simplified. So, uh, this in contrast to 2x plus h, which is never the tangent line slope in Newton's definition. So, uh, Newton <coughs> believed in ultimate ratios in which quantities vanish and are not strictly speaking ratios of ulti ultimate quantities, but limits to which the ratios of these quantities decreasing without limit approach. Okay, So, they were also called evanescent quantities, just a bullshit expression for Newton's inability to understand why his method worked. And of course, Newton's methods are falsifiable, meaning that they can be shown to be true through experimentation. And Newton's understanding is very similar to the modern one, but he described it exactly as he empirically discovered the method. He was heavily criticized uh, because he couldn't explain his ideas, neither could Leibniz. And of course, um, there was this debate about rigor. And so Leibniz also, Leibniz introduced some other garbage called the infinite small, infinitely small and indefinitely small so that each conduct itself as a sort of class. In other words, a lot of hand-waving, uh, highfalutin bullshit that really doesn't explain anything. Leibniz was just as clueless as Isaac Newton, okay? And the caveats that arrive from, arise from all the phrases in this paragraph are 
ill-formed concepts like infinitely small, infinitesimal, etc. Infinity itself is not a reifiable concept, so infinitely small makes no sense also. And not to spend too much time on Leibniz, then came along the idiot Euler. And his little spiel was this, that there is no doubt that any quantity can be diminished until it all but vanishes and then goes to nothing. <laughs> Euler was the the inventor of s equals to lim s, and I'm sure you've seen other videos. Then he says, but an infinitely small quantity is nothing but a vanishing quantity. So he really had nothing to offer, I mean, and he actually wrote in his elements of algebra that 1 over infinity is equal to 0, treating infinity as if it were a number. Then came along de Lambert, who said that an ultimate ratio is a quantity to which this z over u approaches more and more closely. So the the Lambert presumes the Lambert presumes the existence of such a quantity. Okay, he also pres presumes that real numbers exist and any of them can be stated. And of course, he says nothing is clearer than that. But evidently, nothing is clear. And then came along Cauchy, and of course Cauchy had this wonderful statement here, when he says when the value successively attributed to a variable approaches indefinitely to a fixed value in a manner so as to end by differing from it by as little as one wishes. This last is called the limit of all the others. And of course, Carl Boyer wrote a scathing uh, refutation to that in his history, the history of calculus and its conceptual development. And of course, Cauchy was also way off the track. Then came along Weierstrass and his original definition is actually based on Cauchy's uh, uh, statement of the derivative. And of course, it says, indeed, if the absolute value of a quantity can become smaller than any arbitrarily small quantity, then one says that it can become infinitely small. But when a function is of such a nature that the infinitely small changes uh, correspond to infinitely small changes of the function, then one says that it is a continuous function of the argument, blah, blah, blah. But you'll see that Weistras took the ill form concept in terms of infinity and infinitely small and just turned it into epsilon delta, right, explanations, which are not rigorous at all and which don't actually prove anything, except uh, that if you guess the limit, you can verify it. So, and now I'm going to show you another applet I used in my classes, and... Um, I'm going to show you, uh, let's see, is it this one? Uh, no, I can't remember which one it is. Okay, uh, let's see if it's this here. All right, it's this one here. So I'll, I'll give you links. These applets are all free and you can download them. And by the way, if you can't see the screen, a good thing to do would be to blow it up to full screen so that you can see all the details. Now, in my classes, I would use this uh, applet to, to show them what this epsilon delta story was all about. So what it says is that really you're looking at a range <clears throat> on the x-axis being mapped to the y-axis. <clears throat> and what you're saying is that if the distance between the x, this x point, the blue line, and this one here is less than a certain value, then it implies that the distance between uh, this blue line and 3, which is the limit, is less than epsilon, okay? So, uh, of course, you always pick the smaller delta because if you pick the bigger one, then you're going to run into problems because the bigger delta will not work on this side of the point, okay? So, so it will work till about 0.71, right, 0 0.7, that, so that's okay. But if you try to go more to the left, that's not okay. So that's really what uh, limits are all about. And of course, in my uh, teaching classes, I would have all these examples, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then I, I also had uh, uh, a class where I would, you know, give them theorems such as this. This, by the way, is uh, my theorem, <laughs> and it's uh, a lot more reliable than any epsilon delta bullshit in the mainstream. And uh, Again, we come to the diagram for understanding, and I would give them an example and a solution. And of course, as you progress, they get more difficult, you know. So, 
And you also have the piecewise crap, which f of x cannot be both these functions, can be only one of them. But this is a kind of bullshit that you're taught in mainstream calculus. And of course, the solution and the proof, okay, using my method, because my method makes sense, uh, and it's reliable and gives you the exact deltas and epsilons, uh, which you cannot do with the methods that your bullshit idiotic professors teach you in mainstream calculus. So uh, basically what I'm trying to tell you here is that um, the fucking cranks on Math and everywhere else on all those sites that they criticize me and everything, saying that I don't understand what I'm doing. Well, I used to teach uh, the mainstream calculus and I learned all these things in my teenage years, meaning that I was already way ahead of the fucking idiots, okay? And I knew that there were problems with this. That's why I developed the new calculus, which is 100% rigorous. Uh, moreover, I discovered a historic geometric theorem which has, which produces uh, for both a definite and for both a, a derivative and definite integral, exactly the same results. And I'll also place links to those so that you can study them in your own time. Now, uh, that's pretty much it. I'm, I, I definitely don't have time to cover all the check boxes. But I hope you've enjoyed this little redo of the history of calculus, um, showing what happened between Newton and myself, because I was the first to produce a rigorous formulation in human history. No one else. There was no rigorous formulation. I am the greatest mathematician today. And of course, I'm a genius. And that's not boasting. It's just a fact. And so I'll leave you with this and hopefully speak to you again in the near future. My name is John Gabriel, and this is a new calculus channel. Till next time, goodbye.